Each March, in the bitter cold of the late South Dakota winter, hey. emotions heat up. Final cut, come on. Enthusiasm grows. And athletic talent takes center court. For two weeks each year, the most accomplished players from towns large and small come together for the South Dakota State Basketball Tournaments. Face twice, goes up, gets the bucket and a foul. They come to prove their skills. If it's not there, then get set up and go back in. Good, Good defense. defense, don't put them on the line. Go go back. Back. They come to express their pride. And a skillful few come to bring home the championship trophy along with the bragging rights. Each year for the last century, the South Dakota State basketball tournaments have brought tens of thousands of fans, young and old, together in a way that no other event can, sharing common values, bringing towns together, celebrating hometown pride with hope for the future and a connection to the past. You're watching a production of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. In my memory bank, those State B class tournaments were uh, as exciting as anything I've ever seen. It was just packed in those days, 9,500 in Sioux Falls, and we even had 11,000 in Rapid City for the first state final there which was amazing because the, that's the first five-figure crowd I ever saw in South Dakota indoors at a high school sports event. And the best part's probably being on TV uh, every time too and watch yourself play and I got many tapes of those and it's fun to look back and, and watch those. The state tournament's something that uh, I'll never forget and I feel very fortunate to, to have played in three of them. One of our players was a farm kid that came into the arena for the very first time in his life and looked around and, and you know his eyes got very big and he says, geez, you could store a lot of hay in here. For over 100 years, basketball players and fans in South Dakota have experienced their own version of March Madness. It's really a thrill to win the state tournament. Go Lappy, Lappy for three, it's good! Whoa! The Boys State Basketball Tournament and there have been a number of changes along the way. From the evolution of how the game is played and rule changes. They can throw it deep. Wide, it's a three-pointer. No, the Raiders win the state championship. To packing high-capacity arenas and expanded media coverage, the tournament has come a long way from its humble beginning. In 1912, Charles Hochstetter of Huron College arranged the first ever state boys basketball tournament. Fourteen teams were invited to participate in the one-day single elimination contest, but only eight attended. After trailing 21-11 in the first half, Redfield won the game 33-25 over Lake Preston and took home the Silver Loving Cup. Huron College would sponsor similar tournaments for another four years, and in the 1916-17 season, they invited the South Dakota High School Board of Control to take control of the tournament. The tournament continued to be an invitational, and in 1917, 29 teams competed for the title, with Huron winning the championship. In 1918, the Board of Control changed the format to include district tournaments to qualify for the state tournament. Elkton became the first high school team to win back-to-back -back titles, winning state championships in 1919 and 1920. Those teams were led by Leonard Jimmy Lovely. Jimmy Lovely was an outstanding scorer, averaged 23 points a game at a time when 40 points was a team's total. In 1927, the tournament field was reduced to an eight-team contest. Each team qualified for the state tournament by winning their district and region. In 1930, the South Dakota High School Board of Control experimented with two state tournaments by sending the eight regional winners to the A tournament while the runners-up went to the B tournament. That year, Huron defeated Yankton 17-13 to win the A tournament 
and Mitchell beat Volga 33-23 to win the B. However, due to poor attendance and gate receipts, this experiment lasted only one year. From 1921 through 1935, the tournament rotated between the Sioux Falls Coliseum and the Corn Palace in Mitchell, with Yankton winning seven titles in a 10-year span. The tournament was being dominated by the state's largest schools. That lopsided balance led to a big change in 1936. In a move considered revolutionary at the time, South Dakota divided its boys' basketball teams into two divisions based on enrollment. The small school tournament was classified as Class B. The large schools were in Class A. In the B class were some 250 schools with enrollments of less than 300 students. For the state small schools, the idea of their own state boys basketball tournament tried in 1930 had not been forgotten. The result caught the fancy of South Dakotans to the extent that there would be no turning back a second time. My freshman year in, uh, in high school, it was all one class. And uh, we had 13 teams in our, in our district. And uh, that little town of Bradley won our district and had a terrific team. And, but when they got into the region, they had to play at Aberdeen Central, and of course they got beat. But then my sophomore year in high school, that's when they divided it into two classes, A and B. In the inaugural year of the two-class system, Huron was crowned the first Class A champion by beating Sioux Falls, Washington 22-20, while the Class B champion was Coach Elijah Smith's Ogallala team from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, who defeated Bridgewater 24-22 by using a relatively new style of play, the fast break. That was the first really good, quick, small team I ever saw, was that little. They never, none of those kids were very big, but boy, they could shoot, and they could pass that ball like around there and whip it around and get that zone out of position and take a set shot. Despite losing money on the B tournament a year earlier, the Board of Control decided to give the Class B tournament another try. The 1937 Class B tournament was held in Aberdeen at Spafford Arena and the semifinal game between Redfield and Murdo became one for the ages. That uh, game between Redfield and Murdo in the semifinals of 1937 was one of the best high school basketball games I ever saw in my life. Wonderful game. The Redfield game is, was reported by some of them as being the fastest and if you can imagine at that time after every basket, you brought the ball back to the center and you had to center jump. So it wasn't just picking the ball out and going with it. So you had to do that. So the game was slower. Redfield was huge. They had 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and Murdo had a very small team. And when they came out against Redfield, I thought surely that uh, Redfield would eat them alive, but uh, they beat Redfield. The Class B tournament was a two-day affair with an opening round played on Friday, followed by the semifinals and championship game being played Saturday afternoon and evening. I look back and you try to figure, well, we weren't, we didn't think we were tired, but we were very tired and it showed in the game against Dolan because we went dead for about three quarters. Although Thune's team didn't win the championship, the experience of going to the state tournament was a rare opportunity. You know what, at that time, this was, this was in the 30s, the tail end of the, of the Depression, and uh, you didn't travel very far. If you got outside the county, you know, you were doing pretty good. And so anything of that nature was, was really exciting. Got to stay in a hotel <laughs> and, and uh, eat out, so it was, it was a really great time. The format for the Class B tournament has basically remained the same. Arlington made the Class B tourney three of the first four years it was held, and they won it all in 1938, which made folks start looking up the word dynasty in the dictionary. From 1937 until the 1939 State B tournament, Arlington established a winning streak of 61 games, losing to eventual champion Deadwood in the semifinals. Teams did not play for third and seventh place in those days. In 1939, the Flandreau Indian School won 32-30 over tournament host Rapid City. The coach of the 1939 Flandreau Indian team was Sid Beam. 
His wife Lillian didn't travel with her husband to Rapid City. Instead, she planned on listening to the championship game on the radio. And I know the night that they went into the championship, I couldn't, I had a small radio and I couldn't get it on my radio, but uh, I, we lived in the dorm, we had an apartment in the dorm, and they could hear it, I guess, very, you know, they could kept, kept up with the score anyway. Yeah, they won it just the last couple of minutes. I guess, uh, I think one of the boys intercepted a pass and went right down and put the basket right in. The game was over. The 1939 Class A contest was the last state tournament played west of the Missouri for nearly four decades. In 1941 and 43, Sioux Falls, Washington was crowned champions in Class A, while Mobridge won back-to-back -back titles in 43 and 44 in Class B. But the most dominant team of the decade was Webster, who was runner-up in 1945, then went on to three-peat in 46, 47, and 48. They rotated the tournament between Mitchell, Sioux Falls, and Aberdeen. So my freshman year was at Mitchell, and my senior year was at Mitchell. To date, they are the only team in South Dakota to win three consecutive championships in any class. However, a controversy surrounded the opening game of the 46 tournament when Webster squared off versus Platt. That game has probably been talked about as much, at least as much or more than any state three game it ever played. Because it was right after the war, there was a lot of excitement. People were happy the war was over and, and uh, I had the ball with seven seconds to go, going into the north basket at the Coliseum with a one-point lead. And we had a two on nothing fast break. Looks like we had the game won. But I made the mistake of passing it to the guy in the right hand of the wing, and he, he made the lap, but he traveled. But the rule stated in that the clock didn't stop on violation. The only time the clock stopped was free throws and timeouts. And there was a big controversy between the Webster people and the Platte people as to whether or not the referees administered that traveling violation right. Platt led the whole game and then left Ingebrigtsen got a rebound and threw the, the ball the length of the court and it went in to beat Platt in the last second. He threw the ball to Webster, he left it mid-court and he turned around, made a nice shot. He was a strong kid and went right through, never touched anything and beat us one point. <laughs> Despite appearing in four straight state tournaments, Jim Iverson's team never played in a title game. The first year when I was a freshman, everybody in Platte was happy to get there. And you usually don't do very well when you're just happy to get there. You, you gotta go to win. He scored a record 253 points in 11 games during that time, a record that lasted for 45 years. Yeah, I think I had 71 as a sophomore, 72 as a junior, and 82 as a senior, something like that. Jim Iverson was probably the best high school basketball player I ever saw. In that game against Webster in 1946, I don't think Jim Iverson missed a shot until the fourth quarter. He didn't take a shot unless it was a percentage shot, and he was fabulous. The 1949 Class B title would go to the Miller Rustlers, who finished the season with a perfect record of 29-0. Well, what I understand, we're ahead of their time. Terry Zimmerman was one of the first guys, first guys, if not the first guy, to uh, shoot a jump shot. They mostly did the set shots, and so putting the ball up over the top of your head and, and jumping up there and shooting, that would talk about a revolutionary idea. That was also the first year that White River earned a berth in the tournament. At that time, it was tough getting in from West River because really only about one team would qualify from, from there due to the population split and districts and that type of thing. You go through an eight-team district and a four-team regional, and they played the regionals all in one day. So you had to be in shape, and so uh, it was a big accomplishment, we felt. The 1950s have been referred to as the golden age of basketball in South Dakota, and attendance at the state tournaments reflected that. Well, they used to talk about the Big B and then the A tournament, and those two tournaments uh, were kind of the, 
you know, the end of winter. It was kind of the climax of the winter activity. So it was a big thing, I think, socially across the state as well. The bee tournament was probably the jewel crown of all of them. You need the lottery ticket to get in. If you were a sports fan, this is the biggest thing in our lives. Life was pretty, uh, it wasn't as exciting as it is today, but it sure seemed that way for us. Excellent host, the people of Durham, and uh, certainly the most wonderful facilities that you could find at a state tournament. It had been over 30 years since Huron hosted a state tournament until 1953, when the Huron Arena opened and brought the State B Tournament back to the Fair City. Well, the tournament was kind of going, went from Sioux Falls to Mitchell to Aberdeen, and kind of, and then Huron came along and really stepped out and built something that, it seemed to me it was whole 10,000, but I think it only held about six to eight someplace in there. We didn't have anything like that around Britain, you know, a place that size. We had a, we had a big gym in Britain, you know, uh, 1,200, you know, or something like that. And then you walk into here in the arena, and 5,000 in there. I'm sure we walked around and looked up, you know, like typical farm kids. It was the biggest arena that I think we had in South Dakota at that time. So it was a big deal. And uh, a, a mother of a friend of mine drove us up there because Ravinia from our conference was playing in it. And we saw Oneida beat Ravinia and the Hall brothers. Uh, one and a push shot in and out by Youngberg. Not good. Followed by Hyde. It's good. Kent Hyde gets his first field goal of the ball game. The first field goal for the Oneida Warriors. They trail 4-2. Ravinia out in front. There's Abbott now. In his first year as head coach at Haytai, Jim Marking's team earned a berth in the state tournament, losing in the finals to Ipswich. They would return to the contest the next three years. There had some good, good players, Harley Peterson, Jim Peterson, Stan Peterson, uh, Dick Sauer, uh, Garney Henley. Haytai was in a league of its own. They really had remarkably good athletes and, and they were very good at what they did. Marking's Haytai squad won the title in 1954, beating Provo 47 to 40 and returned to the championship game in 55 where they battled against White River. So when I was a freshman, I went to see Haytai play White River and uh, Haytai had a, an amazing athlete by the name of Garney Hemley, one of the best athletes the state ever turned out. And he was kind of a one-man band against White River who had a couple of really big kids and a couple of good shooters. They went to overtime. And uh, I've often said that State B final was one of the most exciting games I've ever seen. Henley has two free throws, two crucial ones right here. Missed the first one. 28 seconds to go. Henley shooting his second one. And it's good. Basket by Bechtold. 55-56 White River over to Hate High. 12 seconds to go. 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Sioux Falls, Washington won the 1955 Class A title and repeated in 56. They also became the first high school to win five championships in boys' sports during the same school year. Football, golf, basketball, tennis, and track. White River would return to the Class B tournament in 1956 and lost to Cresbard by one point in the opening round. We played at Aberdeen in 56 and were state runner-ups, and then we went to Heron in 57 and beat Corona for the state championship. And, uh, Man, those arenas were huge, just huge. And uh, we got a chance, you know, when we weren't there as freshmen and sophomores, we'd go and watch the games and just, man, we just kind of, you know, worship the ground that some of these players walked on. Man, if we could just get in there once. So then we had our chance. So it, it was a great experience. Corona would return to the Class B tournament heavily favored to win it all in 1958, and they ended up in the championship game versus Canastota. And with uh, only about a minute to play, Canastota was behind. But by the end of regulation time, they had uh, gotten within three points, but the clock was about to run out. And a player whose name is Roger Faber who was a great player at Canastota and then at the University of South Dakota. 
took a shot from outside that would have been insignificant if it had gone in. There was no three-point line then. If it had gone in, they'd have lost by a point. But he got bumped when he shot. The ball went in, he made a free throw. It went into overtime and Canastota won a game. That was impossible for them to win, except they did. Huron won the Class A tournament in 1958, posting a perfect 22-0 record. The Tigers were voted Team of the Decade and were led by Rex Sweat, Denny Bush, and Nick Brode. After leading Haytai to four straight State B tournament appearances, Marking left to coach at Watertown. My first year, we won five games and lost 15. That's more games than lost all four years at Haytai. When we lost 13 games all four years at Haytai. And uh, yeah, it was really bad situation, but uh, it worked out pretty good. A boy named Tom McGrann was 68 came along and uh, uh, we built a ball club around him. He went on to Minnesota and started all three years there. So we uh, we got we were runner up in 58, we won it in 59 and runner up in 60. 1962 marked the year that the Sioux Falls Arena was built and they hosted the State B Tournament. I can remember coming into the arena and I, I got lost and I thought I was going to miss the first game because I couldn't find our locker room and because of just so many people. Attendance jumped from the previous year from 37,200 to 54,000. It was also the last year that Huron would host the A tournament. Pine Ridge won the B crown beating McIntosh by two points. In fact, all three games the Thorpes won in the state tournament were won by a total margin of eight points. The Thorpes would return to the championship game in 1963 when they squared off versus Alexandria. In my sophomore year in 63, we beat Columbia in the first game. You know, of course, a lot of these schools don't exist anymore. Columbia and then Howard in the second game. Then we uh, took on the defending champions, the Pine Ridge Thorpes, in the championship game <clears throat> and uh, ended up winning that. It's a joyous occasion, certainly, for this fine community of Alexandria to have these worthy champions to reign as the Class B South Dakota Kings for one year. We've really been wonderful fans this year, and I don't know what else to say. We're really happy with it. It's really a thrill to win the state tournament. I didn't really feel overjoyed last night when the ball game was over, but now when I see all the town people out there and from neighboring towns, I, I, it's really really thrilling. After getting beat in the region tournament in 1964 versus Fort Pier, Alexandria would return to the State B tournament in 1965. When I was a senior, we ran the table and had an undefeated season and, uh, and played, we do ranked number one all year. We had, we really had a good team. My brother Mel got sick, very sick, after the championship game of the regional tournament and didn't think he was going to be able to play. He drug himself out of bed and ended up playing in the state tournament, but games were a lot closer. We just got by Agar in the, in the first game. The second game, we played uh, Brandon Valley. Ended up beating him by a point. Mel, Mel made a basket with two seconds left. I, 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 was, I tied a guy up on a rebound and tipped the ball to Mel, and, and he made it to, to win the game by a point. Then the third game, we beat Trip, although it was, you know, it was a good game for a while. And uh, so those games were more competitive my senior year. After winning a Class B title with Kresbard as a player in 1957, Bob Swanhorst would return to the tournament in 1966, this time as head coach of Webster, one of the orphan teams of Class A basketball. Talent is not necessarily the only ingredient for championships. It's how kids get along and how they learn to adjust and how they accept what you want to do and so on. Clyde Hagen was, uh, was the star, a uh, big, uh, big left-hander and, and uh, they were called Hagen's heroes. And uh, you know, Swanee just uh, whipped him into, uh, into a, a great team. And once we, we won the state tournament that year in Class A, so then I was, I was in coaching and that's, that's where it went from there. It was exciting. And you know, here as a rookie coach, I thought, well, yeah, that's what you do every year. You know, you go and you coach and you go to the state tournament. 
After losing the Class B title game in 1965, Tripp would return to the State B Championship game in 1967, where they capped off an undefeated season, beating Harriet 72-46. In the Class A tournament, Brookings would take the title in 1968 and would return to the championship game in 1969, where they faced Dave Strain's Rapid City Cobblers. And that was a year before we split the schools. Uh, we had talent from both sides of town in there, and it culminated in uh, Rapid City Cathedral closed down the year before. So uh, John Dutton was uh, one of our great athletes in South Dakota. So we had him as a senior, but also we had Jack Dennison, Steve Withorn, Randy Stopey, Bob Briss, uh, Rich Gary, John Quislett. As far as a talented team that could really uh, run people off the floor, that had to be it, I think. Uh, we lost our first game early in a road trip uh, to Mitchell, but then we won 24 in a row and never played from behind from the second half. So. Every once in a while you're blessed with an uh, array of talent that uh, can, kind of fit and uh, are just a little bit better than uh, what you get uh, year after year. Oneida won the 69B tournament over to Smet 93-90, which is still the record for most combined points scored in a championship game in any class. Probably the most exciting state tournament game that I've ever coached. I mean, even though we lost, I mean, it was exciting and fun. I remember Randy Jenks staying, saying to me afterwards, uh, <coughs> we'd gotten beaten, we're standing around where they're giving out trophies, and he says, Coach, he said, we, we didn't play that bad, did we? <laughs> I said, no, we played really well. DeSmet would return to the Class B Finals in 70 and 71, winning back-to-back -back titles. In 1970, I, 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 don't, I don't think we had a game closer than 19 points in the three games, and uh, just had kids that all stepped up, and they stepped up at the right time. And, it was fun. For a school to have an undefeated regular season is a big accomplishment. To follow that up with a state title is an even bigger deal. And the Miller Rustlers did it twice, in 1949 in Class B, and again in 1972, this time in Class A. The Rustlers would face the returning champion Sioux Falls, Washington in the opening round. It was a great opener for the, for the turn last game, Sioux Falls, Washington home team, home court, and here's this little old town from Miller coming in, playing the Class B basketball, so to speak. Utilizing a full court press and an up-tempo offense, Miller defeated the Warriors and faced Rapid City Stevens in the second round. St. Patrick's Day was that weekend. They were playing the tournament out in Sioux Falls, and and uh, they, I remember St. they played Rapid City Stevens one of the games, and Ethan Hanks, the late coach of Rapid City Stevens said it's a green machine at St. Patrick's Day. The Rustlers dominated their game against Stevens and would face a tall task against Bob Winter's Yankton Bucks in the finals. Chad Nelson driving all alone. It's a tie game. We never played against anybody of Chad Nelson's height at 6, 10, 6, 11. And um, we never, I would say never, rarely did we play a zone defense, but I know we incorporated some of that. If not, uh, then a very much sagging man-to-man, -man, surrounding him with as many guys as we could. That strategy worked. They were a little bit nervous, I think, um, and then got behind early, which put a little more pressure on them and uh, not so much on us. And uh, it kind of played into our hands because we, set the tempo, which we normally try to do. Uh, that's how we had to try and uh, win games, forcing teams to play to our, our speed. I knew it was something special. I'd be hard to replace him because you just don't see stuff like that that often. I don't think it that still hasn't been replaced to this day. There have been some great teams since then. Don't get me wrong on that one, but boy, that miller Rustler team is still the best one I've ever seen. Five seconds, 68-54. Hoagland with a shot at the buzzer. Miller, the state A champion. Undefeated, 24 straight wins. Final score, Miller 68, Yankton 54. This is Coach Bob Doctor, the undefeated Miller wrestlers. Congratulations, Bob. It must be a real thrill to go all the way like this to a state title. You bet, Doug. Uh, we made sports history tonight. Uh, according to the paper, uh, we're the only, or Miller's the only club to go all the way undefeated in Class B. 
And now we've done it in Class A, so it's really, a, really that put a little extra frosting on the cake. After the tournament, it turned out that Miller was actually the 33rd largest school in the state and should have been playing in Class B, which made winning the tournament all that more meaningful. We had no idea when we had slipped below the, the 32 mark and to would, would have been a Class B school had, had it been the, the right year for readjustment. So. I do know we were tickled that we did, that didn't happen. Otherwise, uh, I don't think the team would have been noticed nearly, not anywhere near the way it was. It would have been another, um, just another nice Class B basketball team. The Britain Braves won the 72 Class B tournament. That team suffered only one loss during the regular season to the eventual Class A champion, Miller Rustlers. From 1970 to 1978, Yankton would reach the Class A final six times, winning titles in 74 and 78. Just missed the second one, the rebound by Gelhaus. He lost it, and that's it, the Yankton Bucks are the 1978 State A basketball champions of South Dakota. As we said, uh, they've been waiting a long time. And there's head coach of the Yankton Bucks, all smiles, John Errett. And up he goes. And what do you think the chances of that nice looking white suit getting a little damp tonight, Hodley? Well, it might get there, but uh, he isn't gonna mind a bit. He no, he sure won't. The 78 Class A contest was the first state tournament held at the brand new Rushmore Plaza Civic Center. It was amazing how similar it is to the Sioux Falls Arena. You know, you came in the back door just like you do in Sioux Falls, had the same configuration, the locker rooms were the same. Actually, this I don't know if a lot of people know this or not, but the Rushmore Plaza Civic Center Arena came off the original design for the Sioux Falls Arena in 1962 and the money, money factors came into it and so they couldn't build it quite as large or as, as nice. And so they were forced to go on a lesser scale. Webster won the Class B crown in 1977 by defeating Armour 63 to 49. Intercepted by Wadowski, it's all over. Webster is the championship of state Class B basketball in South Dakota for 1977. It was the last game the Packers would lose for the rest of the decade. We tried to instill the, the discipline and the desire and the fundamentals that we thought were important that we had seen in other teams that were successful. And, you know, at the time we had had great kids that were accepting of that. They were hungry for, for a winner here. Here they come. He'll slow it down or will he? Keep it taller off the glass. He got it. That might do it. Armour beat Elk Point in the 78 Class B title game, 57 to 53. And the Armour Packers, the new state champions, 57 And returned in 1979 to face Beersford. Nearly 11,000 spectators filled the Rushmore Plaza Civic Center to watch the game. We got the Big B in 79. The final there was one of the great games in history with Armour beating Beersford in overtime. 11,000 people in the Rushmore Plaza Civic Center for that game, and 11,000 people with all the West River team playing in the finals. The game deemed by the Argus Leader poll to be one of the best uh, basketball games played was the Beersford Armor Overtime State Championship in 79, where, where uh, Brian Bender hit a shot to send us in overtime, to overtime when it seemed like we were actually out of the game. The Packers have to come the length of the, of the floor. The length of the floor. In nine seconds. Right. <clears throat> Jeff Tiefenthaler will put it in play to Dan Friedel. Racing down the court. Six seconds. Five. Brian Bender. It's tied oh. up with two oh. seconds. Here we go. We go into overtime. And then we actually won in overtime and, and kept the streak going. And, and kept, kept, got our second state championship. And Armour is the champion again. They win 55 to 51. Armour's 64 game win streak would end in 1980 after getting defeated by Beersford. We just went out with the same goal every every game to do our very best and, and to play up to our potential. And, and most of the time that was good enough. Pierre would win the 1979 Class A tournament, beating Rapid City Central. The Cobblers would return to the title game in 1980. And with an average basketball team really on record and all on the season, they were barely above 500, I think, on the season. But Davy Strain, the coach of the Cobblers, always had a way to get them together. And, 
he did that year, and they beat Watertown in the state title, and that was in the Civic Center. Our players knew from the past that uh, in those last six games, why we were ready for about anything. And uh, even though we didn't have the track record we had the year before on season wins, why we were a good ball club. Throughout the 1970s, declining enrollment forced many small town schools to close and merge with other schools. So the farms have dwindled in number, and as they have, so have enrollments at a lot of small school, smaller schools. I am very familiar because I married a girl from Haiti. In her high school years, all four years, they went to the state high school basketball tournament. Class B, very unusual in those days to do that. Now, they are part of a consolidation that involves all of Hamlin, uh, Lake Norton, Bryant, Hazel, Haiti, four schools. My assistant coach taught over at Bryant, our junior high coaches. I had one in Lake Norton, one up at Hazel. When I was in high school and playing, there were 13 teams in my district. Well, when I became superintendent of schools Clark, in 1975, uh, the Clark school system had consolidated seven of those schools. There was Ash and Raymond and Logan and Garden City and Bradley and Lilly and Thorpe. Um, they were all in the Clark school district. Those consolidations were, were interesting for me because they were consolidations of towns that had been uh, often bitter athletic rivals. Some of these consolidated schools would become regular participants at the State B Tournament. In a 10-year span from 1974 to 1983, Hamlin would earn a berth in the Class B Tournament eight times, winning titles in 74 and 83. We had quite an experience with Burnell over the years in the Armour Packers, you know, from 78, 79, 80, 1, 2, 3. Uh, seems like we either played him in the Freeman Classic or uh, we drew him. That's back when the state tournaments were just drawn out of a hat, and there were like three years in a row, I think, that we drew Armour in the first round. I don't know what, uh, how that keeps happening. We even had a change in governors, and it still didn't help any. <laughs> Hamlin would get past Armour in the 1983 Class B Finals by a score of 45 to 40. In low, they go to Frederick, who'll turn, bank, score, the basket counts, and he's fouled by Boas. The Mitchell Colonels won back-to-back -back titles in 84 and 85. Those teams were led by coach Gary Munson. Long years of frustration for Gary Munson are over. He finally has that elusive State A championship. The 84-85 uh, team would have to stick in my mind because we went undefeated that year, and there's, it's tough to go undefeated. There's not many especially in our class, or any class as far as that goes. And uh, our top seven players that year went on to play college football or college basketball. In 84 and 85, Wakanda and Lyman won the Class B title. The 1985 contest would be the final year for two-class basketball in South Dakota. Starting with the 85-86 season, basketball in South Dakota would be divided into three classes. Double A for the largest 16 schools, A for the next 64, and all the rest would be Class B. There was enough feeling among small town high schools that their opportunities were nil in getting to a state tournament because the just a bit larger schools were so strong they couldn't get past them. At that time, I was from Clark. In your Clark, the last thing in the world anybody from Clark wanted was three classes. Because uh, the patrons of the Clark District would rather play Henry in, in Florence than Sissick and New Melbourne. When you added another class, obviously that took a good portion of the schools that we used to play out of play. And we were in a Central Stevens in Douglas, and uh, that wasn't very much fun. And then they went to three classes, and whew, we're excited again, you know. And, uh, we can compete and, and we can have a chance to, you know, win the district, uh, win the region for the state tournament. There's seven members on the board of control. Three of them were violently opposed to it, and three of them were violently in favor of it. And I was the one that was going to have to make that decision. 
And I didn't particularly want to, want to make it. I was the one that made the decision for the three classes. And I made a lot of enemies. <laughs> and even some of my best friends in Clark weren't were too happy with me. Uh, but like I explained to them, I said, when we have our good teams in Clark, we don't have any trouble beating Sisseton and Millbank. We were better off playing Sisseton and Millbank, you know, teams that we were going to, Sioux Valley, uh, that we were probably going to run in or had a chance of running into in the district and region tournament. But a lot of those old rivalries were very, very important to a lot of folks. So I always felt it was better to play the good teams, regardless of class, than loading my schedule with all Class A teams and some of them that we didn't, that may not have been very competitive at all. I think overall the three class system benefited everyone in the state pretty much. It really did a good job, except maybe the sports fan who really enjoyed the old Big B tournament. That was a that was a classic, no question. In the first three class state tournament, Dakota Christian won the B tournament. Hanson won the A crown and Mitchell won the double-A title, their third consecutive title. They are only the second team in South Dakota to win three titles in a row. The three-class split didn't have much of an impact on the double-A class. South Dakota's 16 largest schools had dominated the A class since basketball was split into two classes in 1936. But for those 16 schools who had been competing with them since 1952 when Class A was expanded to the 32 largest schools in the state, they would have an opportunity to showcase their abilities and represent their communities at the state tournament. One of the first schools to step up in the new Class A tournament was the Pine Ridge Thorpes. They earned a berth in the Class A tournament six consecutive years from 1984 through 1989. The big thing about it was our kids wanted to win. They wanted to put in the time and they did. That extra time in the gym paid off in 1987 when they were crowned Class A champions with a perfect record of 26 and 0. I just said, Brian, I want the toughest schedule you can get us. And he said, I know to play the good schools, they won't be coming to Pine Ridge. We're going to have to travel. During that time, no one wanted to play us at home. So, you know, we, we wanted to get the toughest schedule we could for that 87 team and go out and play. And, and we, were, we were really lucky we did. Well, you know, they went undefeated that year, 26-0. and 0. Uh, We only had four games that year, home games. Uh, all the games we played in Montana, we played in Wyoming, we played everywhere. Along the way, in those games that they won, you know, they beat some double-A schools at that time that were still playing us. Well, I think what really hurt Lennox is when they got in foul trouble there, you know, they were trying to bang with Will inside. And, you know, Willie White had one heck of a game tonight. I think anybody that watched that performance, it really, you know, saw some good basketball playing there. The Vermilion Tanagers would win back-to-back -back titles in 1988 and 89 in Class A, while Aberdeen Central would play in three consecutive AA title games from 87 to 89. In 89, they faced Rapid City Stevens. Big defensive play, it's up for grabs. Williamson give it to Pajkowski, rabbit hole. That's right, it was a great, great game. What a very exciting game it was. Klein nearly won that game in a last second shot. Just barely missed the shot, just deflected off a little bit. I'll guarantee you they're going to try to get it to Eric Klein. Oaks, five seconds, four. Kuzler baseline, blocked by Pyatkowski with two seconds left. Aberdeen has got the ball for one last gas. Here we go, two seconds on the clock. They're going to tell him not to push inside. Aberdeen in a four-man stack. Pagel told his Raiders not to let him get the ball inside. Make him throw it deep. Line, it's a three-pointer. No, the Raiders win the state championship. They're first in school history, 54-52. We're staying here. The Raiders are celebrating. It's party time in Rapid City. I remember the shot that uh, Klein missed that uh, could have won it for him off to the right. A jump shot that he's probably made 10,000 of. Um, so, I mean, you remember those. In Class B, Northwestern played in three consecutive title games from 89 to 91 and were on both sides of a two-point title game. 
In 89, they were two-point winners, and in 90, they lost by two. In Class A, Custer played in five straight title games from 89 to 93. In three of those years, they were matched up against the Lennox Orioles. Closer, Mack Robs driving, pulls up right side, can't get it. Cooper there for the putback. The team that comes up first and foremost in my mind has got to be Custer. We played them all three years in the state championship game. And uh, they, you know, we won my sophomore year, and then we got second to them my junior and senior year. So Custer's always in the forefront uh, of my mind. And they were obviously coached by uh, Larry Luchens, who's just a legend uh, in South Dakota basketball. It seems like all the time. I mean, who would you play? Lennox. I, mean, I could just bet we played Lennox. It was like, that's unbelievable. Our teams were 68-4 and four when I played. Uh, unfortunately, half of those uh, losses came in state championship games. Um, but we had a lot of success. Uh, we didn't take it for granted. We just played hard and worked hard. And like I said, from 91, 92, and 93, we had seven guys uh, that played college basketball. And I think that's really a testament to Coach Hooten uh, and the Lennox uh, uh, basketball program. South Dakota Class A boys basketball champions. Does it make it extra special for the both of you guys to have played Lennox again, or were you cheering for White River last night? Oh, we were cheering for White River, but we know we want Lennox. We wanted Lennox again because they're the number one team, and we had to prove to everybody that we were the number one team. And... Warner played in four Class B title games in five years from 92 to 96, winning back to back in 93 and 94. Rebound controlled by a wealthy follow up shot is good. Down to Severide, back to Miller. Spins, moves, and nice shot up last from Mike Miller. Speaking of winning back-to-back -back titles, Mitchell won back-to-back double-A -back titles twice during the 90s, in 90 and 91, and again in 96 and 97. Some years you might be, you might have a lot of talent and uh, you don't do so well in the state tournament or don't maybe not get to the state tournament. And some years you don't have that talent like you had previously, but they play together, the chemistry is better. And so that's been kind of a goal of mine ever since I started coaching to team chemistry and uh, play hard on defense. Uh, I think you have a chance to win state titles if you have a good defensive team. Because usually if you play good defense, your offense will kind of step in and help you out for the night. So. Coach Munson's 96 and 97 teams were led by future NBA star Mike Miller. And a break and he could have a showtime here. <laughs> Turn out the lights and the party's over. He's a first-team All-State basketball player for three years. We only won, uh, like I said, when he's an eighth grader, we got first. When he's a uh, freshman, we got seventh. Then when he's a sophomore, we won it. When he's a junior, we won it. Then we got beat in the last second shot to Brandon Valley when he's a senior in the semi. for the game winner. But he had a great career. He was in five state tournaments. And uh, Billy Donovan was the first coach that ever told me, hey, coach, he said, this kid knows how to play team basketball. You know, and that, I was very proud of that because that's one thing I pushed really hard to, to make our kids do when they play team basketball. West Central played in three straight Class A title games from 99 to 2001, winning in 2000 and 2001. During the 2001 contest, Trojan standout Josh Mueller would set a number of tournament scoring records. All that credit needs to go to my teammates. You know, I score 60 and 55 points and have those amazing state tournaments. But does anybody see Brian Alderson who grabbed, you know, 17 rebounds and set all those screens or Jeremy Schultz? These guys who could have been stars on any other team, but they accepted their role. They, you know, let me do my thing as far as scoring the points and whatnot. And the next thing you know, we rewarded, rewarded with two state titles and one runner up. The Trojans' 104 point performance was the first time a team in any class had scored over 100 points in a title game. For the next two years, Custer and Lennox would once again face off in the Class A title game. This time, they would each be crowned champion. And yet another title for Larry Luchin's Custer Wildcats. That, 2003 is a crusher. Uh, we were undefeated at 125 in a row. And I, I don't remember what their record was, but it, I mean, it was a year that they'd lost a few games, you know. And uh, they totally dominated the game. In 1966, parochial and private schools became eligible for membership in the South Dakota High School Activities Association. 
During the first 35 years, only a handful of teams would play in a state finals, regardless of class. But in the last 10 years, there have been 10 champions across all three classes, with Sioux Falls O'Gorman playing in six title games in an eight-year span. In the Class B ranks, White River has been to six straight Class B tournaments. The first three trips to Aberdeen for the Tigers, the team was led by Louis Krogman. And he'll back it out wisely, but no. Oh, behind the back, left hand and score it. <laughs> oh, baby. Showtime. You know, White River kind of struggled. Um, three years before we went to the state, I think we only won like something like six games. And um, we were just happy to be there and everybody was pretty excited. After receiving fourth place in 06 and third in 07, White River would end up in the title game in 2008. We played Langford in the championship and um, after we got past the semifinals into the championship, we knew that um, our styles, Langford and us, we both like to get up and down the, up and down the court and um, just going to that game, we were, really, we were really confident that we had the upper, the upper hand and that our defense would be able to carry us through that game. And, uh, Ended up being a great game. We ended up winning by a 16 or double digits or something like that. And um, it was just great to actually finally have a championship under our belt. Krogman had a record setting 45 point performance in the 2008 title game. But perhaps something that was more impressive was the record crowd on hand that packed the Barnett Center that night. The atmosphere was great. I love playing in Aberdeen. I love Wax Arena. I think our championship game set a record of most people ever in attendance at Wax Arena for anything. It, set, it was kind of funny because President Bush came and sp spoke there and more people came to our championship game, so that was kind of, that was kind of funny. Over the last century, basketball has seen a few rule changes and a little bit different style of play. But overall, the game of basketball has remained the same. The styles, I think, are all there. The game really hasn't changed that much. Um, the things that were fundamentally good when I was playing in the late 50s are still fundamentally good now. As much contact as there is, he did if they called all the fouls they used to call when I played. The, the game would last forever. <laughs> I always thought South Dakota played more defense than other states. They look at the small, the low scores in South Dakota high school basketball, even to this day, I consider a part of that being better defense rather than lack of offense. South Dakota knows how to play defense, and I think other states realize that when they come here and play us. Bounce passes, Rob goes down the right side, stolen by Austinson. While the success of some teams were better documented than others, those teams' legends still live on in people's memories. I think that people remember those games because it was life and death. It was nothing short of that. You know, it, there was this huge investment the community had. It was a big deal if you got there, and as I say, and for many of these towns, it only happened once in a lifetime. The Harold Cardinals are the state B basketball champions. The Harold Cardinals win it all in Aberdeen. What a great victory. Harold ends the season 22 and 3, the champions in South Dakota. In South Dakota basketball, all that's really, really important is what you do at the end. You know, if you go to the state tournament, people are going to remember that. The Custer Wildcats are the State A boys basketball champions. To this day, if I walk down the streets of Yankton, somebody will come out of the store and say, you guys got beat by Beersford. You know, all the things I've done in my life, that's what I'm going to be remembered for. There are a lot of outstanding high school coaches in the state of South Dakota, and they do a great job year in and year out, and that's one of the reasons that there's so much talent in South Dakota. I've never, ever, in all the times that I've coached, lost a last game and didn't say that was it, I'm done. I'm not ever going to coach again. But, you know, three, four days, and you kind of forget that. So you, you hope that you didn't say it publicly, you know, or anything, so anybody heard you say it. Sometimes some of the hardest lessons you will ever learn are in situations where you had to kind of pick your chin up off the floor, congratulate the other team, and and then just move on. You have to want to be a winner, and you have to want to put in the time. 
And I sometimes I think it's hard to be an athlete in this day and age with all the things that are there for you. If you want to be a good basketball player, there's absolutely no secret about it. There's no special drink you need to drink, you know, no special food you have to do. You just got to put in the time. Learn how to do things the right way, and then from that point on, it's just practice, practice, practice. Even my wife would hate to admit that it is kind of impressive that 30, 40 years later, people are asking about some crazy little, little town <laughs> with a basketball team and what it was like after all these years. I could never compare anything to what it was like in 2008 when we were playing the state. You know, that was, uh, that was some of the best moments of our lives, you know, me and my high school teammates, and um, it was just really fun. The White River Tigers are the 2008 State D Boys basketball champions. No matter which class of basketball an athlete competed in or what town they represented, everyone who ever participated in a state tournament share one common bond, the desire to hoist the trophy and be crowned kings of the court.